Well, hello. Great to be able to share a few words with you. And first of all, I want to say a huge thank you from Jeannie and me for your wonderful love and support and prayers for us. Um, after 18 months of trying, uh, we're finally here in the UK, living in a place called Chichester. Um, uh, we've, we've, we came, we've, we've moved back from the US. We felt, first of all, we felt God calling us to, to do that. But practically, uh, we wanted to help our, our mums, uh, 92-year-old mums. Unfortunately, my mum didn't make it. Um, she's gone home to heaven. She's been, been promoted to heaven before I could get here, um, which is sorrowful, but I'm grateful that she's, she's home and more alive than we are. And of course, also to, to see Ben. It's a reason for coming back. So we made it with your prayers and support. So thank you for that. And thank you for this opportunity just to share some thoughts with you um, from the Exodus 32, this topic is the golden calf. But before we get into the into the topic, I want to just remind us of Romans 15 verse 4, which says that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So whenever we turn to scripture, we always have to ask the question, Lord, what are you, why did you were saying this? Uh, why did you say this story? Why do you tell this story? What are you saying to me specifically through this? And how do you want it to change me? God always is looking to change us more into the likeness of Jesus. And I think there's two key messages from this chapter. One is to do with the great command, which is to love God with everything we have um, and love others. The second is the great commission, which is about sharing the great news of Jesus Christ with other people. Go and make disciples of all nations, etc. So um, those are the things I think we're going to, to uh, look at. Those are the two things I want to, to highlight. But I want to start with a quote uh, from Charles Dickens from The Tale of Two Cities. And uh, he said, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was an age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. And that was true for middle of the 18, 1800s, Dickens, Dickens Day. It was certainly true um, of the children of Israel in their, in their era. era. It's true of most areas. It's certainly the true today, isn't it? With COVID-19. There are some wonderful things that God's doing behind the scenes. I've got a friend who leads missionary teams all around the world. He says he's never seen such outreach and such many people coming to know the Lord. God's doing incredible things behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, but also, it's, it's, um, we have some tough times. And certainly with the children of Israel in, in Exodus 32, they'd seen some amazing things happen. Uh, been set free from over 400 years of slavery and now they were free um, and God was with them and he'd been doing some great miracles with them but also they were having a challenge in the desert they were going through some testing and that's very similar to us in our lives so let's just ponder for a moment on what was it that God had shown this generation of the children of Israel they they had seen God smash the gods of Egypt with the, the ten plagues. Each one was designed to show uh, the people that God is God and Lord and their, their gods were nothing in comparison. Um, he'd opened the Red Sea, unbelievable miracle. They'd gone through the water there on dry land. He destroyed the Egyptian, the mighty Egyptian army, being destroyed just like that. Before their eyes of the children of Israel, they'd seen it happen. Uh, they'd seen and tasted and experienced manna coming down from heaven. They'd seen the, the, the Amalekites being, being uh, destroyed. Uh, they'd seen God turn up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, the mountain sh shaking, smoke, trumpet, uh, God speaking audibly to them, giving them his moral law as a, pre a preface to the Ten Commandments. The, um, all of these things that they'd seen. They'd, they'd had some incredible, incredible accounting. Probably the, the, there's never been a generation like it that has seen such miracles going on. Uh, God doing such incredible things. 
And yet they come, we come to this situation where they have a, an affliction. Something doesn't go to plan, according to their views anyway. Because Moses had gone up the mountain, uh, we're told, in Exodus 32. He'd gone up, and uh, Exodus, 90, uh, sorry, Exodus uh, 31, he'd gone up the mountain. He was there um, receiving the Ten Commandments. And in verse 1 of Exodus 32, we're told that the children of Israel are wondering where he's got to. And they lose hope and they're, they're no faith. Uh, where's this man Moses got to, they say. Um, and they take things into their own hands. You might think it's not much of an affliction, but uh, affliction to individuals are, are very different. You can never say to someone, oh, you haven't got much going on. To them, there is a lot going on. They wondered where Moses was. Maybe he'd been killed by a wild animal. Maybe he'd fallen down the cliff and he was dead. And now they're stuck in the middle of the desert and their great leader, who, who God seems to work through, through amazingly, uh, he's not around. What are we going to do? And they do the most tragic thing. It's a very, very sad time because they turn away from God. They rebel. Uh, it says it in um, Jeremiah 17 that the heart is desperately wicked, deceitful. Who can know it? And then it says in the next verse that, that God tests our heart to show us what's going on. And God certainly was doing that with the children of Israel. So they turn away from God and they turn to uh, this terrible idolatry of this creating this calf, golden calf, and they commit sins of, of um, sexual immorality there. And the big question, the big question I have when I read that is, Lord, why? Why would they do that when you show them so much of yourself and so much glory and you bless them so incredibly, so quickly they turn away from God? Why is it that we turn away from God when things don't go to plan, to our plan? Why is it that we, we go our own way and we, we mess up? Why is it we do that? And that's what I want us to look at as we, as we study this word. Um, and so before we, before we get into the specific teaching, let me just say a prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We love your word so very much. It's a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And Father, I just pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts specific things that you want us to learn from this passage. For your glory and for your honour, Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, I believe the answer to that question, why is it they turned away from God, is to do with the great command. It's to do with our hearts. See, in Psalm 103, verse 7, it says that uh, God made known to his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. There are, are a few people in the Old Testament that God reveals him to, himself to. Um, David would be another one, uh, Abraham, where he, he, he specifically shows himself to them. He, he stirs their heart. He shows them his great love. He shows them his character. He shows them his ways. He shows them his purposes. And they, they love him. Tremendously they love him. We today in the, in the New Covenant have that great privilege where God has poured out his Holy Spirit into us and given us a new heart so that we can all know him, know his ways, know his love and be in love with him and follow him from our hearts. Tragically, in the Old Testament, um, they had a dead heart. It needed to be revived. The whole of the Old Testament points, it's a signpost, pointing to the need for a saviour. God gave them the way to go and they could never keep it because their, their heart, their fallen heart was sinful and was always going, rebelling against God, going their own ways. Today, um, we have to keep that heart and we'll come on to that later on. But so Moses knew God, knew God, God's heart. The, the people of Israel knew God's acts. They didn't know him and his heart. And it comes down to the love that's in our heart that leads us um, to do the right things. You see, spiritual warfare takes place in the mind, but it's decided in the heart. You get all these thoughts that come in, temptations and all everything else. The, the ability to make the right choice, to say no, it's God's grace in our hearts. We say no to sin. We say no to going the wrong way. And temptations, that flows from our hearts. 
um, when we're in love with Jesus, with everything we got, we only want to do the things that please him. Well, the children of Israel, so when it came to their affliction, they knew God from their head, uh, not from their hearts, and they took and made the wrong choice. I have to say in my own life, uh, my first 17 years as a Christian, I went the same way as the children of Israel did here. I received Jesus as my saviour, did that when I was quite a young young lad, went to church and went all through the Bible studies and all of those good things. Um, but he wasn't my Lord. He was my saviour. He wasn't my Lord. Uh, it was, the analogy would be that I, I invited Jesus into my house, which is my life. He'd come into the front door. He was in the hallway. But the rooms of my house, I wanted to be Lord still. Uh, the rooms for my ambition. Um, I got into running. I be, that became the golden car for me. It was an idol for me. It came before God. An idol is anything that comes before God in our lives. I ate it, slept it, drank it. My whole life revolved around my running and getting to the top, getting to the Olympics and all of this. Uh, a room for business. I started a business at university and making money. Um, uh, all of those things. Pleasure. Yes, I wanted to indulge the sinful nature. Um, those were all that I, were idols in my life. There were rooms where, yeah, I, all right, Jesus on Sunday and going to Bible study. Um, but the other parts of my life, no, I, I, I said, I'm going to be in control there. We can do that today as followers of Jesus. Even though he's, he's stirred our hearts, we can, we can separate areas of our lives. Could be our career. Lord, I'll follow you, but not my career. I, that's for me. I don't trust you in that area. It could be for, for our future. I want to keep control of my future. It could be, yes, finances. I want to have control of my finances. I don't fully trust you in that. It could be our family. Sometimes our family is an idol. It comes before God in our lives. Yes, we need to love our family and to take care of them. But God's always got to come number one and be first. And so I, I went away from God. Uh, I realised uh, in my mid-teens I was become a, becoming a hypocrite. That's the last thing I want. And so I turned away from God, went my own way. Never, didn't ever not believe. I always believed, but I just didn't have the power to follow him. It wasn't until 1980 when I had an encounter with God, 22 years old, and the Holy Spirit turned up, poured in God's love into my heart. And here's the difference. I fell head over heels in love with Jesus Christ. From then on, all that I cared about was pleasing him. That's, what, that's when you're in love with someone. All you want to do is please that person. And it was God's love. So it, it's all God. When you come down to it, it's all God. And I, 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 wanted, I said, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do whatever you want. I'll go wherever you want. I'll do the things wherever you want. Whatever happens to me. You see, that's the motivation that we need in our heart. Not from the head. We need it in the heart. At the end of Romans 11, it says, From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. And then it goes on in, in chapter 12. In view of God's mercy, therefore, dear brethren, in view of God's mercy, in view of all that God's done, in view of the Holy Spirit coming into our hearts and this love that we have, this power that we have, and we implore you, off offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. What is the pattern of this world? It's all about me. It's all about this rebellious heart. It's all about what I want. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you can attest and approve God's will, the things he wants for you, and what things are happening in your life and why they're happening. Then you can attest and approve his will, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So... The great command uh, is so important if we're going to make right decisions when we come to challenges in our lives. And we will face challenges. John 16, 33. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. God permits them in our, in, in our lives so that our faith can grow in him. So we can discover more of this life that we have within us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Because when we go through suffering and the hardships, we discover this incredible grace. What is the grace? It's his life in us. It's Jesus in us. And the Holy Spirit, we, we learn in John 16, 14, takes from what is Jesus is, that's his comfort, uh, his restoration, his redemption, and his triumph, and he makes it 
real to us. So God turns it round for his glory. Amazing. So he gets it all. So we need to know this love. That's why the Apostle Paul was always praying. I pray that you've been rooted and grounded in love, might know, know the, the, the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's love. Uh, and, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you might be, be filled with the, the whole uh, uh, knowledge of God. Praise God. So that, that is, is where we need um, to have the great command. So important. Love God with everything we've got. He's reigning in our heart. Um, yes, we enjoy the crown. Um, all the good things of God, but also there's the cross. Sometimes we need to realise that there's a cross involved in following Jesus. Praise God. So when you go through the next difficult time, remember that. Um, flow from your heart, because then your decision's not going to be, what do I want out of this? But God, what do you want from it? So let's have a look now at the Great Commission. The Great Commission is that, that we are here to tell other people about Jesus and share to be a witness to his grace. So Moses was going through affliction. You remember what happened with Moses, that he was in God's presence. He was receiving the Ten Commandments. And then he gets this news from God um, that they are, uh, the children of Israel are turning away from, from, from him. They've rebelled. And um, can you imagine what he felt like, uh, Moses, with all of that, all that God had done? He loved God so much. And to think of how the children of Israel basically kicked, kicked um, dirt in God's face, as it were. They turned away from him, gone their own way, and they'd rebelled after everything that God had done for them. That was bad news. That was an affliction for David. That was some suffering for, for not David, for, for Moses. And so it's interesting to see his reaction. The children of Israel's reaction was to go to self. Uh, we're going to make an idol for ourselves. Moses isn't here. We're going to do it. Is all self-centered. What Moses did was to think about God. And he turned around and when he heard the news, he said, God, um, you can't, God, because God had said, he said, I'm going to destroy the children of Israel um, with all that they're doing. You and I, Moses, will start again. And Moses interceded. He said, no, you can't do that, God. This is about your glory. See, his first concern was about God's glory. And that should be our first concern as followers of Jesus Christ, living sacrifices. Lord, whatever happens in my life, I want you to be glorified through it. I want your name to be lifted up. And so Moses prayed that, Lord, don't, don't destroy them. Because the people around this earth will say, well, he got them out of Egypt, but he couldn't take them into the promised land. And so God, it says God relented. He, he didn't. He, ch he changed his mind, so to speak, although God was testing Moses in this. He was showing us how we should pray. He's showing us a, a, a prayer pattern for us. And he turned it around. I went through a period about 18 months ago when I was actually going through a real fight of faith. You can read about it in my upcoming book, uh, Living Hope, which comes out on the 9th of June. Um, and I was I was struggling, actually, because I was struggling with the scriptures that I was standing upon um, for many, many years, um, the persistent widow, for example, because here's the point. Any bad things that happen to, our, to us in our lives, God's permitted it for a reason. God never causes evil. Don't ever think that. He never causes wrongdoing in our lives, but he does permit it. We see that with Job. We see that with all so many people in the, in the Bible and through history. God permits it for a greater eternal plan and purpose. And I knew that. I, I, I knew that, that, that Rebecca and Alex, there was a reason behind all that had happened to them. And uh, God was going to turn it around for good. And I've been praying that along with the, the lines of a persistent widow. Remember, she'd had bad things happen to her and she cried out to the unjust judge, give me justice against my adversary. Well, who's our adversary? Well, it's Satan, isn't it? And so we want to see if anything's happened in our life, anything has happened that we know is not in line with God's word, we want to see God's kingdom come and turn it round. Romans 16, 20, may the, the God of peace, God gave me this after Alex went home, actually. Uh, the God of peace will, will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God wants us to be mighty warriors for him. He wants us to be great witnesses for him and to turn around the bad things for good. Maybe it's a child that's not following Jesus. Well, the, we can stand on a scripture that says, um, train a child in the way he'll go. And when he, when he gets old, he will not turn from it. So we can stand. Lord, you said this. I want to see your word fulfilled. 
That's what Moses was doing when he was interceding for the children of Israel. He was saying, God, you've said this. You can't, you can't turn away from this, God. This is your word. And we see it through scripture. Uh, mighty men and women of God who took God at his word and would not let things pass. They wouldn't just say, oh, that's, that's just happened. We'll forget about it. No, they came to God. As it says in Isaiah, it says, Do, don't give God any rest until he establishes his kingdom. We're here to bring in God's kingdom. So Moses in the next chapter, chapter 33, we, we, you will read that he, God says, oh, I'm going to send my angel with you. And Moses said, no, that's not good enough. How are people going to know that you're with us unless you come? And he said, I want, no, you've got to come, God. Daniel, he realised the 70 years of captivity were up. He set his face to see God's kingdom come in. Nehemiah, for the war, the same. David, when, they were, when Goliath was mocking, mocking God and the children of Israel. That's not right. And that's got, to, that's got to change. Gideon would not accept, what's happening, Lord? What's happening is not right. I want to see your, 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 you turn up and your, your kingdom come. God's looking for us to be men and women of God who know him. Daniel eleven thirty two. Those who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Praise God. We know what his heart is. We know what his will is. We know what his kingdom is. Um, his word says, and we're going to pray until his kingdom comes. Well, I was praying for months. I'd get up in the middle of the night and pray for sometimes two hours, weeping sometimes, shouting out to God. And I was getting really burdened by it. Finally, thank God, Jesus turned up and he just said to me, I didn't see him audibly, but he just said to me, Gerard, trust me, I'm going to fulfill my word in my timing. And that's a, we have to come back to trust as well. We have to come back to trust him. But don't just accept things in our lives. Turn it around with prayer. It's happened that you can be a mighty warrior to bring in God's kingdom. Pray. So what have we learned? We've learned um, some things. I'm going to give you four points to end with. Four keys. What should we do to have the great command and the great commission alive in our lives and be faithful in God's calling on, our, on us? Number one, make sure that Jesus is our first desire. Make sure there's no idols. In, at the end of 1 John, it said, do not have little children. Keep yourself from idols. Make sure there's nothing in our lives that comes before him. He's got to come first. Uh, my favourite verse, uh, Proverbs 4.23, Above everything else, my child, keep your heart. For out of it flows the wellspring of life. Don't let any Japanese not weed. I've heard, I heard Nick sharing about that. Great word. Don't let anything that's not of God settle in your heart. Bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, disappointment, discourage. They don't belong in the heart of a believer. Get rid of them. Number two, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, regularly fill you with, the Holy, with his love. Romans 5.5. 5. It's his love that keeps us making the right decisions and laying our lives down for him. When it gets tough, we lay our lives down. We take up our cross and follow him. We don't compromise on the word of God. Number three, we, ke we, we realise that this, we're part of a much bigger story. Boy, are we part of a bigger story. <laughs> this is just a vapour. Um, we, we've got a whole eternity ahead of us and God's preparing us for a great work that we're going to do through eternity with him. We are rewarded through eternity. It doesn't get us to heaven, but it, it's a reward for our faithfulness to his calling. And we're also his, um, we're, we're instructing the angelic realm in the wisdom of God. Uh, Ephesians 3 verse 10. Great calling on your life. You're very special. You've been called out. Never forget you're part of a bigger story. And it's all about him and his will and his purposes. Number four, finally, uh, be patient. Be patient. Hebrews 6 verse 12. Let, uh, we do not want to be you to become lazy. If you've been following Jesus for a long time, like, like uh, Jean and I have, um, it's very easy to put your feet up a bit if you're not careful. No, we want to keep the zeal of the Lord, the passion of Jesus in our hearts. Don't get lazy. Keep seeking God's face. Um, Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what God has promised. God's promised us great things in his word to bring in his kingdom. We're here to do that. And when our work is over, we'll go home. But for now, we're all out for his glory and for his purposes. May we pray. 
Lord, we thank you for the, the great story of the children of Israel. Thank you that you've recorded it. And Lord, we, you've recorded it that we can learn. Lord, I pray, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit once more into our hearts that we might be passionate for you, that your love would keep us uh, on fire for you. Your love would cause us to say no to anything that's ungodly and not of you um, and keep on that path that you've laid out for us. Uh, Lord, help us to be great witnesses for you. Thank you that we're still on earth for that purpose, Lord, that we can represent you, be your hands and feet for your glory and for your honour. And Lord, I thank you that you called us to be patient uh, as, you're, as you're working out your plan and purpose. Lord, we love you and we bless you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much. God bless.